It's a voice rarely heard, the voice of a formerly enslaved person. Few know that in the decades following emancipation, interviews were done in an effort to preserve their stories. And in tonight's Prime Focus, you'll hear some of what they said as part of our partnership with the 10 Million Names Project. ABC's Alex Perche brings us their stories in their words. I want you to tell me how you got your name. I got my name from President Jeff Davis. The president of the Southern Confederacy. He owned my grandfather and my father. My grandfather was a blacksmith. And my father had learned how to write a little bit in Richmond, Virginia, before he brought him down here. You're listening to the voice of a formerly enslaved American, a man by the name of George Johnson. <laughs> This rare and historic audio interview was recorded in 1941, almost 80 years after Mr. Johnson gained his freedom. He and his family worked on a plantation in Virginia owned by Confederate leader Jefferson Davis, a staunch opponent of abolition. In the interview, Johnson recalls a day in the life as an enslaved person. Did they drive the uh, slaves down there and Davis has been very hard, or did they work them reasonable? Reasonable, reasonable. You know, uh... Marsha Jewel gave my Jeff another boy. And uh, he died with, boy was chopping cotton. Boy didn't kill with the gang, you know what I'm saying? He come to whoop the boy, boy kill you know what I'm saying? Went to the house of Marsha Jewel, boy. And that's what the trouble, son. Say, Mr. Stone don't whoop me, cloud and kill with the gang. You know? Audio tape interviews like this are striking and uncommon but are actually part of a long legacy of black families, communities, and institutions, including historically black colleges and universities, that lead the way in collecting and preserving the oral histories of the formerly enslaved people in the 19th and 20th centuries. In the 1930s and beyond, technology allowed some of these interviews to be recorded as part of both federal and independent projects. The details are often difficult to hear, but they remind us this history happened not too long ago with names, faces, and stories. Do we know roughly like how many of these recordings exist? The recordings are relatively rare, um, but the recordings come from a much larger and really um, important and in many ways unsung uh, collecting effort uh, that took place. In terms of audio technology, most of it <laughs> was not recorded by audio because the technology didn't exist, at least in any kind of widespread accessible way when most of those were conducted. So it's really just a handful of audio recordings we have. In 1974, a woman named Celia Black, at the age of 114 years old and shortly before her death, recalled picking cotton in Texas as a child born into slavery. I didn't have to pick cotton or nothing. I didn't do nothing about that kind of feel. What kind of feel, oh goodness. Me and my husband would go out west and pick cotton. Pick cotton. Go out west every year. We've been in this year going out there picking cotton. One of the things that kind of struck me, when you have an interview re recorded in 1974, for some black Americans, I mean, they're, they're one generation removed from, from slavery. In some ways, we think of slavery as ancient history. We think of it as something that happened a very long time ago to people we couldn't possibly have known. I was six, seven years old in 1974. So it's kind of amazing that we were alive at the same time. I was alive at the same time who was someone who had been born enslaved. Alex Haley's uh, Roots premiered on ABC just three years after this interview with Celia Black. What's your name? Kunta. Kunta Kinte. Alex Haley came into his work, Roots, what became Roots, really, through, through his grandmother's stories. So we're really talking about oftentimes great-grandparents at, at this point in the 70s. Dr. Kendra Field, chief historian of the 10 Million Names Project, and Harvard professor Vincent Brown explained how these recordings illustrate an enormous preservation effort. The first-hand accounts shedding light on the darkest chapters in our American history, yet also revealing incredible African-American strength and survival. Didn't you have some entertainment doing a dancing or anything? Oh, I used to dance, but I don't do it now. No, I don't dance now. I try my best to serve my master. I'm trying my best to serve my head and father. 
you hear these recordings. What were the emotions when you when you hear you know the the recollections of 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 a, of a Celia Black? First is just the miracle of her survival. It's just that I'm I'm actually hearing this person who had been enslaved. It's that's kind of a miracle. Celia Black was alive when Abraham Lincoln was president, and lived to see the resignation of President Richard Nixon. Oh man, you remember Abraham Lincoln, President? Oh, well, they they gave him a good name. Oh, Abraham Lincoln. They thought Abraham was a this. They thought everybody thought Abraham was the best president they were. In a similar effort to preserve this history and legacy, the 10 Million Names Project is a moonshot endeavor that aims to use the power of ancestry research to identify the names of the 10 million men, women, and children who were enslaved in the territory that became the United States. The goal is to put names and faces on this vital history, not only to give the enslaved the dignity they deserve, but to connect those living today with their family story. With the help of the 10 Million Names genealogist, we were able to find the direct descendants of Celia Black. Yeah. In Rhode Island, we met 68-year-old Curtis Royal, who spent time with her as a young man. She's my great-grandmother from my mother's side of the family. Do you remember any of the stories that, that she would tell? She told us about how difficult it was, you know, just being alive during that period. And of course, she would tell us a story about the big ox that they had, they had two of them, and uh, how her father would put, set her right on the head of the ox and she would just hold on with the, with the horns. So those are, you know, as a, as a boy, you know, those are fascinating, you know, you say, wow. My grandfather had some big old oxen. He had one with a big one, wide horn. Oh, it looked like a house. <laughs> wide homes and, and and I used to sit up there and clean them homes and then his name was Coley. His name was Coley and the other one was named Lep. Was it ever difficult to talk about slavery? Yes, and uh, I think what made it uh, so difficult is, is just uh, realizing, you know, how, how emotional it was and what they went through. You know, you try to put yourself in their physical being and to understand what they went through, and it, it's, oof, you know, it, it is scary. You've heard the recording yes. of, of your great-grandmother yes. in 1974. It was very challenging for me to hear when they asked her the question about uh, what it was like working in the fields, the heat in, in Texas, the humidity, and, you know, sometimes 105, 110 degrees, and I, I, I just can't fathom waking up, sun up to sundown, working in the fields. How did they do it? How did they do it? You learn about slavery in America, I think especially being a black American, the initial emotion is, is, is anger. There's the history of slavery as an institution, which was all about oppressing people. And that's a very dark history that I think should make us angry. But then there's an African-American history of survival exactly. through and beyond that institution. And that's kind of amazing to hear people, you know, accepting that I lived this life, it was incredibly hard, and I'm still here, and that I've survived, and I've got children, and I've passed on some kind of legacy how does who's conducting these interviews and how they're conducting these interviews, how does that matter? Oh, I mean, it, it's enormously important. For the WPA interviews in general, the vast majority are white interviewers. Mm. Some are the children of the former slave owners, in fact, mm. um, that are interviewing a former slave, right, of that same family. But everywhere, slavery was a system for allocating status. And slaves and ex-slaves were supposed to be low-status people. And so when they were talking to people who they perceived to be of higher status, they had to be very careful about what they said, right? Because those people could determine their fate. While many of the audio recordings don't reflect it, slaves were frequently subjected to heinous forms of abuse, including beatings, sexual assault, and forms of torture. The historic 10 Million Names Project, in which ABC News is the exclusive media partner, is an ancestry database that the public can access 
add information to and use as a research tool. And because so little information about enslaved people was officially documented, amassing this data is a huge task. We encourage anyone that wants to get involved to reach out, to go to the website, and, um, and, and to be part of that project. Who stands the most to, to gain from hearing these? I mean, is, 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 is it black folk? Is it younger black folk? Is it, is it, uh, is, is, is it white America? Is it, is, it, is it Americans as a whole? If we're going to understand anything about freedom, then we're going to have to understand the people who were denied that freedom. I mean, the While very few of us will have the opportunity of hearing our ancestors' voices on tape, the 10 Million Names Project hopes that one day all black Americans will have the chance to know their ancestors' names and stories the way that Curtis knows Celia. You had the chance to know your great-grandmother. Yes. How powerful is it being able to connect that dot? It's extremely powerful. You got to, to hear it from her directly. Not something that was passed on, but to hear it directly from her, her pain. Our thanks to Alex Proche for that. And for more ancestry stories and information about the 10 Million Names Project, scan the QR code on the screen to visit our newly launched ABC News 10 Million Names digital landing page. You can learn more about how to personally contribute to the project, access recommended reading lists, and more. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.